Hi, it's Jerry with I Love RV Life. Today, I'm going to be covering the 10 items every RVer should have in their emergency kit. Well, hi, it's Jerry, and Jenna and I have been traveling in our RV. Wow, think about this, for almost 10 years. This has been an amazing adventure. Some of this has been five months of travel out of the year. We've gone to almost nine months of travel in the year. Uh, we've gone trips that were just a couple hundred miles. We've taken trips that were almost 4,000 miles. A lot of different types of travel and places that we ventured to, and it's just been wonderful, wonderful experience and continues to be so. Now, what we discovered day one was we needed some things to prepare for an emergency. Some of these items we knew we would need when we traveled day one, and we may have got a little carried away and probably half that stuff we never used, never will use, and probably stuck back in the corner of a garage somewhere. You know, I'm probably preaching to the choir here. I'm not the only one that's done that. Other things we have acquired as we have traveled and something happened and it was a minor repair that we could make and then we could continue to move forward. So what I'm going to do today is share with you some items, we'll call them like small little categories of items. Some of this is going to be an individual thing. Some of it might be a couple things that we have used in our emergency kit. Now, this is not something you're going to find in a bag. You're not going to find it in one of these big plastic totes. These are different types of items that are either in the RV or in the back seat of our truck um, that we can travel with. And if something happens of a emergency nature and a minor emergency nature then uh, we're going to make sure that we have them. I'm not going to be going through first aid kits. We all know that we need one of those. Um, I'm not going to go through a fire extinguisher. Everybody by law I think should even have one in their camper. Uh, mine's right here to the right of me at the door. I've got one in the truck as well. It's not those types of things. These are things that I think that we need to be able to have from an emergency standpoint that may not come with your vehicle or may not already be included in your RV. Now, before I get started with the 10 items that I'm going to be discussing, let me talk about being prepared, preparing your RV before you leave. Proper preparation of your RV before you leave can eliminate so many emergencies that you have out. Look, before you travel, the week before, if, if you're a part-timer, you know, and you're doing this for weekends and holidays and things like that, don't wait till the day before you travel to test the RV. Hopefully you've got a way to be able to plug it in, make sure the air conditioners work. Hopefully if it's cool, you'll be able to turn on your propane, make sure your heaters work. Turn your refrigerator on a couple days before you travel and make sure that it gets cold. I can't tell you how many people I've run into out in the campgrounds that says, my refrigerator won't get over 70 degrees and now they're stranded and they're on a long-term vacation and um, just a nightmare, you know, because, you know, they're living out of a cooler. That's not fun. So there's so many other things that you can do. I I've got videos on this. Go out to I Love RV Life. Go down to the bottom. You've got to search. You can type in a lot of different categories and you'll see where I've talked about checklists and being prepared and those types of things. So I'm not going to consume this video with those types of things, you know, checking your tires, Make sure that those things that you know that are broke and may strand you, please get those repaired before you travel. Just do that. And then you're going to have a great time while you're out on the road and you're not going to be part of the nightmare crowd that we hear so many people talk about. Oh my gosh, this happened while we were out there traveling. Many times, many times, not always. It's because they weren't prepared. Okay, let's go to item number one. If you have just bought a new RV or you've had one for a little while and you still have that stock mattress that came with the RV, you're going to go, Jerry, I know where you're coming from. I feel your pain. And that pain is those mattresses are like, the nicest way I can put it, cloth covered concrete. They're just awful. They're terrible. And that's in the largest percentage of the RVs that you purchase today. The mattresses are just terrible, terrible. Well, Joan and I tried everything. We put in pillow toppers and then we didn't like that. We put a gel topper. We didn't like that. And then we tried foam, those foam things that you add. And it just made bad, not even better. It was just, we were never comfortable with that. And then we found rvmattress.com by Brooklyn Bedding. This is a signature series. The comfort is just absolutely 
amazing, just absolutely amazing. You go to the website, you pick out the size that you want, and look, there's dozens, dozens of different sizes of mattresses that you can find inside of an RV, and I think they've got them all covered. Simply click on the size that you want, bang, you can go ahead and make your order, and when that order comes in in just a couple weeks, comes in a small box, it is so simple to install. You just take it out of the cardboard box, spread it out on the platform, carefully take it out of its plastic. Within minutes, the mattress expands to full size. No off-gassing. It's wonderful, it's comfortable, it's easy, and it's ready to sleep on that night. There's four different types of mattresses to consider from Brooklyn Bedding. They're all foam, all the way up to their hybrid series. Joan and I have this signature hybrid. We just absolutely love it. But the benefits don't just stop there alone with ease of installation. You have a 120 night sleep trial, 10 year warranty, free shipping, and they're made in Arizona. Well, if you would like to get your own Brooklyn bedding mattress, then go to rvmattress.com forward slash I love RV life. Select your mattress, select your size, the comfort level that you want, and then at checkout, enter the code I love RV life and receive 25% off your purchase. Well, I'd like to thank RV Mattress by Brooklyn Bedding for sponsoring today's video. These mattresses by Brooklyn Bedding, wow, they're amazing. Everyone should have some lap sealant in their camper. I don't go anywhere without it. I keep two tubes in our camper. I've always kept two tubes in our camper, and we traveled for almost three years before I ever needed it, and boy howdy, when I did need it, I was glad that I had it. Now, there are all types of different lap sealant. Uh, one of the most popular brands out there is Dicor. I've used Dicor uh, and I've had success with it. The problem with Dicor, it just doesn't last a long time. It, it cracks, it ages rather quickly, but it works good. I mean, for a year or two, but sooner or later, you're gonna have to peel that stuff off and use it again. Now, I use something called X-Trim. I've been using X-Trim for a long time. Um, and I have found that it just works absolutely fantastic. It's a different product. The good thing about X-Trim, and, and I mentioned it earlier, if I don't need it and somebody next to me had some kind of an emergency occur, uh, this will work on your, your what you call your TPO roofs, which are your rubber style roofs that most of your campers have. Um, it will work on um, PVC roofs. We have a PVC roof on our camper. Uh, it will work on aluminum, it will work on fiberglass, it is uh, kind of like a universal sealant and it is a lap sealant. Don't run to Lowe's or Walmart or Home Depot or something like that and start buying a bunch of silicone. Um, it is not, it, it will, first of all, it will not be a lap sealant that will collapse and seal properly on your camper and it might actually cause some harm to your roofs and those types of things if you need it. So this is worthless without uh, one of these applicator guns. You know, these are cheap. You can get them just about anywhere. Um, again, you're gonna be able to need this. And let me share with you a couple reasons why you need this. Um, it's, it was a, it's happened to us twice, and not in our Montana, but happened on our gateway, that our sunroof cracked. Now, every year I get up on the roof, I check everything, make sure that everything looks good. But our sunroof that was over the bathroom um, that plastic will age. I've got a couple videos on that. You can, again, go out to I Love RV Life, hit the search, and you can see how to replace those. But what happened, uh, both times it was traveling in the winter, and what happened is the heat would come on in the camper, and that crack, ever so small, uh, would expand and then contract to the cold. So as long as it was cold as we were traveling down the road, we were fine. We got into the campground, we warmed up the camper, those cracks opened up every so little, we had a pouring down rain, and the bathroom was a mess, and water just got everywhere, and I was able to take our lap sealant, go up there with some Windex, clear the sunroof off, just be, it looks almost like fine hairs, and I could see those little cracks, I could put the lap sealant on it, and we continued our trip. One time we continued it for three more months, and then I got home, had to order the, the, the replacements, uh, which probably took another month and you know all was good and if it wouldn't have been for lap sealant 
Um, I would have been up there with duct tape and you know, I guess that would have worked as well maybe, I don't know. But this stuff doesn't blow off. Um, it doesn't peel off. When you put that lap sealant on there, it is good for a while, maybe a year or so. So make sure your emergency kit has a couple tubes of a good quality lap sealant. And again, if you don't have this gun, you're not going to squirt it on anything. If you don't know what a turnabon is, it looks like this. It's, uh, you can get it in different sizes. Uh, I think this is the four inch wide roll. Uh, I keep, here's one that's never been used. Yes, this has been used because I had an event. Um, this is um, something that you definitely want to have in your kit because here's what could happen. And, and I hope it never does. It's happened to us twice. Uh, we had tree limb damage that hit our roof. Oh, it was awful, awful experience. Um, and sometimes you're in, you know, a campground that's got a lot of trees and the big wind blows up and the next thing you know, you had a tree limb hit the roof. I'm not, it may not have gone through the roof. You know, it may not even have entered the camper. But what it did was tear or rip your roof to the point that it's going to let water go in. And, and I will share this with you. Within a short period of time, a rain or two will destroy your roof. Your roof has something called Luon plywood up underneath it if you've got one of these rubber or PVC style roofs. And that stuff will separate uh, and doesn't take long for it to rot. It's a nightmare. The good thing about this stuff is if it happens, you heard the boom, you can get up on top, be careful. Um, you, can put, you, can, you can put this on water. Um, flatten it out, it'll squeeze the water out and it will stick. And I will assure you, if you put this on your roof, you will not be taking it off. It is a permanent attachment. It is extraordinary. Now, you see so many of the things people talking about the Gorilla Tapes. Yep, I got some of that. I attempted to repair an awning where we had some stitching break on our gateway and I tried to use this stuff. Um, did it stick? Oh, it stuck stuck like a son of a gun. But what happened was, uh, this is a different glue and a different material, and as the sun hit it, um, over time, uh, where the stitching had broke, um, it just released and turned into goo and gum. I, I don't recommend using uh, this Gorilla Tape. It, it does have some uses, but I wouldn't be using it uh, for an RV repair on the outside. A Turnabon, on the other hand, is a beast. Now, let's say something else terrible happened. Let's say that you cut around a corner and snagged a tree limb or something and you've got one of these aluminum campers and you ripped a little hole in the side of the camper. I'm sorry if that's ever happened to you. You can put a couple pieces of this, a turnabon on it, and you can rock and roll. Um, nothing, nothing will come in until you can get back and get that repaired. Um, if you've got one of these composites like we have, what they call a composite wall, and you tear a hole in that or crack it or whatever, even a crack, I put some of this turnabon on it. It's not going to be pretty, um, but it's white. It's not going to look horrible like duct tape. Um, and, and it will adhere to that until you can get it repaired and you can continue. This is, this is critical to your emergency kit. Um, I'll leave some links in the description below for some of these items that you're just not going to find in something like a, a big box store. Um, you're going to have to order these uh, off Amazon or go to your favorite camping store and they'll have this type of stuff. Don't bother with the one inch. Don't bother with the two inch. Um, if you're going to get a tear, you're not going to want to be putting strips. Just cough up a couple dollars. Keep it, you know, in the bay of your camper uh, where it's not going to get, you know, 100 degrees if you're parked out in the sun or 150 degrees if you're parking it somewhere during the summer and not using it. And it'll stay cold. And it'll last, it'll last, I don't know. I've, I've had it to where it was several years old and put it on and it just sticks like crazy. All right, get you some Eternabon and that will be your saving grace if you ever end up with some type of a hole or tear in your camper. This one may seem obvious, uh, but you should have some bottled water in your somewhere, uh, in your truck, in your camper, and this, I can't even get this whole thing in the, in the video screen here. This is, what the, this is a golf umbrella. Um, you can buy them anywhere, you know, you can go to the whatever big box store that you have out there. This is my second one. We've already wore one out. Um, it's nice to have as it's pouring down rain and you're trying to get out of the truck and go somewhere. This one's so big, 
the reason I like the golf umbrella style um, is Joan and I can both get in under it um, and we can use it. Now, uh, some of its uses are going to seem just perfectly obvious. We've been in campgrounds uh, where storms have come out and we got an alert and they told us to evacuate and we went over to the storm shelter. Boy, it was nice being able just to, you know, grab the kitties in the kitty carrier um, really, really quick and grab the umbrella in the pouring, pouring rain uh, and, you know, scoot over to the emergency shelter and stay relatively dry uh, or we would have just been drenched to the bone without this. But there's another thing that's happened. Uh, we, we have had two flat tires, uh, not in the Montana. I've learned a lot about tires over the past 10 years, but when we had our gateway, covered this many times in the video, we had some poor tires when we first started off and we had two blowouts 500 miles apart. Now let me share this with you. When you shed one tire uh, and you don't have a spare, we'll go into some more about this in a bit, um, or you've used your spare and you had, you've had two blowouts, yeah, that's what we had happen uh, 500 miles apart, and we're waiting on the side of the road you know, for the uh, tire repair people to come by, and we sat there for almost three hours in the hot sun, you know, on a bank, um, in the heat, this will be your saving grace. You know, for those emergencies where you're going to have to sit out on the side of the road, I don't know how we would have made it without having an umbrella to keep us cool and just keep from frying while we sat out there for many, many hours with no place to be able to go. And on top of that, we've all seen the nightmares of people who are parked on the side of the road and some crazy person's not paying attention or texting or doing something and they roll into the back of the vehicle. I will not sit in a vehicle uh, when we're on the side of an interstate. I will not. I'm going to get as far away from it as possible uh, while I'm waiting for somebody to come and render us aid. Um, and because of that, it may be hot and I may be sitting in the sun and Joan and I are going to be at least a little cooler with our bottle of water and our umbrella. You can get them anywhere. Just get you a big old golf umbrella. If something unforeseen does happen, if you have to pull over on the side of the road, well, putting on your emergency flashers on your RV may not be enough to be able to warn people ahead of time that they need to move over and give you some room to be safe. Now, look at all the long haul truckers, and I think by law, they're required to do this. If you see a long haul trucker that's over on the side of the road, they use these emergency warning triangles. And there's a number of different types that you can buy. Um, there are those that have flashes on them and all those types of things. Uh, this is a, a, a set, you'll see it here. This one's uh, not been opened. I've only had to use these one time, uh, called Victor. Um, again, I bought these off of Amazon. They were relatively inexpensive. You can get them just about anywhere, your big box stores, your auto stores, and Amazon's got a couple different types. I like these just because I'll slide back a little bit. Um, they're, they're easy to use. They're not hard to be able to set up. I think they've got sand or something down in the bottom of this thing, so uh, when we set it on the road and the big trucks came by, it didn't blow it over and knock it down, it stayed in place. Uh, and the reason I like using the triangles is they've got the big hole in the middle, so it's easy to be able to use this. You just kind of twist it like so, um, and then I'm going to have to set it down, I think. and they just fold up like this or unfold like this and then just kind of snap together like so. Um, and then once you snap them together, they hold pretty well and you don't have any trouble with them. And uh, you can set them on the ground like this. <laughs> you can set them on the ground like this. Uh, what I like about them is they're highly reflective. Um, and again, they will stay in place when you set them down. I like setting them down with the bar in this direction of traffic because if you, if you turn this sideways, um, the, they have a bad tendency of getting blown over. Uh, so if you sit them like that, they will not blow over or as likely to blow over. And then I put these out about every 10 to 15 feet from behind the vehicle. A couple will do along with emergency flasher. Um, this probably in height is over a foot, over 12 inches. Um, so they're highly, highly visible. They're orange. You know that they stand out during the day at night they're highly reflective if headlights hit them um, and i think this is a critical critical piece of gear that you should have in your emergency kit they're not very expensive they're not heavy they don't take up a little space you know when they're folded down 
into their small little package here uh, and you can keep them under the seat of your of your vehicle know where they're at at all times um, do before you use them before you go out on travel you know take them apart as I did with this one and make sure you know how to use it before you're out there fumbling around in the dark trying to figure out how they're going to use but you know pick you up a good set of emergency triangles in the event you do have to pull over on the side of the road for any period of time you want to give people plenty plenty notice that you're you know incapacitated on the side of the road and that someone's coming out to help you well i've shared with you many times that yeah we have had issues with tires most people who have been rving for any period of time has had at least an issue with a tire on their rv it doesn't matter where you're pulling a trailer or you're a class a or a class b or something like that um, I, you need to be able to take care of that. Now, I will mention this. If you're in some big 40-foot or you know 45-foot Class A, uh, you having the ability to be able to replace that tire is going to be slim. Those things are giant. They're heavy. They've got specialized lugs on them. Uh, they are beasts, and you're going to have to call somebody to give you some help, like uh, one of these you know, tire trucking firms that you see uh, aiding the folks that are out there on the side of the road who are big rig haulers. But for those of us who are in pull-behind campers, um, fifth wheels, um, a Class B van type, th type thing, or even most of your uh, Class Cs uh, that have the truck front end body, uh, it's, it's relatively easy to change your tire. And uh, in our instances, uh, we've had uh, you know a couple events. We've had two tire blowouts. Um, the first, easy to change out the tire because I had a spare. Uh, the second time, I didn't have a spare because it was 500 miles later. We had to get a trucking firm to come out and bring a tire, replace it on the side of the road, and put it back on. Another time, uh, we had an event where we ran over. It was the most bizarre thing. It was a, a piece of pyramid-shaped gravel. I guess it happened in the campground and it had a sharp point on it and it was very very long and it went between the tread of the tire cut through the cords you know and we ended up with a flat and it's not hard to be able if you're physically able now I understand you're gonna to have to have a little bit of strength and some mobility to be able to replace these tires but if you're physically able to do it it is not hard now let me share this if you've got a um, you know, all you've got is one of these crummy scissor jacks, <laughs> like you see in the back of a small truck or a small car. For most of our RVs, you're not going to be able to jack that thing up. It is not going to happen with those. These are very, very heavy. I guess if you've got something like, you know, a small single axle Airstream or a little, one of these little, you know, single axle campers that you see, or maybe something like those R pods or things like that, yeah. You could probably jack that up because they don't weigh that much, uh, much less than a, v a car does, and that scissor jack would do it if you can find a safe spot to be able to do it. But for most of us, if you're in a large fifth wheel, I mean, this thing here is almost 20,000 pounds. Our gateway before that was 14,000 pounds. You know, if you're in anything like that, you are going to need something called a bottle jack. And this thing's heavy. Uh, this is a four ton unit. I will not travel without a four-ton bottle jack. You can buy these anywhere. Half the stuff that I have here, I'm going to set this down, it's heavy. Half the stuff that I have here is from Harbor Freight. You can buy you a good quality um, bottle jack there, a four-ton, five-ton unit, and you can just jack about any type of multi-axle uh, trailer that exists out there. Or you can jack up your um, your... A class C or class A or whatever you have and then be able to replace the tire now what I would also suggest is somewhere in your camper have you you know a couple pieces of um, just pressure treated 2 by 10 lumber because you're going to need a flat surface to be able to put these on or you're going to be in sandy soil and it's going to sink something like that or if it's wet and rainy the ground might be soft so you're going to need some type of a base and you may not be on a perfectly level space so you're going to have to add some height uh, to the base of this now these unscrew and will give you some length but they're not going to go too far now next you're going to have to be able to get those lugs off that wheel yeah i see you know people have those uh, four ways that you can get and that's all well and good uh, unless you had a tire replaced or before it left the factory they had the gun uh, too tight 
and that thing just ratcheted up like crazy and you just can't get that get that thing broke to save your life I use a big old breaker bar. This is a Harbor Freight special. It's not very, very expensive, but it gets the job done. And I've had some that I could not break any other ways without just being able to get on this thing and get down on it. And then, you know, make sure you've got a, a lug. I use a deep cycle lug. You're not gonna be able to use just one of these little short lugs. Again, Harbor Freight special. Uh, you can buy these as a kit. They're not very, very expensive. Um, Okay, I'll lose the debate that you're not going to be able to run a production shop on this, but guess what? I hope I never have to use it, and if I do have to use it, it's only going to be once in a while, right? But this will break those lugs loose, and this is a deep socket, you know, good hard steel. I'm going to be able to pop those lugs loose uh, and get it off. Look, I'm not going to go through all the details how to change a tire. Um, there's a, probably a thousand videos on how to be able to do that. Just make sure your vehicle's in park, it's secured. Um, if you can put the landing jacks down, uh, do that. Make sure you chalk the tires that you're not replacing, at least on the other side of the axle, and make sure you, you don't have any shift. Um, get it done and get the tire on and off as quickly as possible and then get the jack back down. But there's no need to be able to sit out there for three or four hours waiting for somebody to come help you if you have both the, you know, the skill set to do it, the strength to be able to do it, and you're comfortable that you're in an environment where it's safe to be able to do it and you don't think it will cause you any harm or any damage to your RV, you can easily change the tire on your RV without spending several hundred dollars getting somebody out there to do it for you. Now this is one I'm not going to be showing you. I'm not going to be showing you a spare tire inside my fifth wheel here. But there's a lot of debate that goes on. And look, we've sat around the campfire and talked with this with a number of people of, you know, what do I need to be able to care as far as a kit to fix things like flats that may occur? I shared with you earlier, uh, I had a flat uh, and I could not have repaired it with one of these uh, flat tire kits. You've, you may have seen them in the auto parts store or wherever where you've got the little plunger thing and you put the little sticky gooey looks like a chunk of black string on it and you pull the nail out and you stick that thing in there and pull it back out and it holds the tire. Now here's why I'm not a fan of those. Uh, if you cut the tire they're not going to work. Uh, I, I ran over something and poked a hole in it, a big hole. Those aren't going to work. Um, if you do have a flat tire uh, and you lose all the air, how are you going to pump it back up? Now, I see this little small, and I bought one. I bought one of these small compressors. It was expensive as all get out. That's 12 volts, and you would hook it up to the tire to pump it back up. Um, and it took hours and hours and hours because I have to run 110 pounds of pressure, both in my old Gateway tires and here. And to put 110 pounds in took forever. Now, I do have... Uh, and I don't consider it part of my emergency kit, I do have one of those pancake style uh, air compressors like you would use on a job site. I do have that. Um, and I've used it. Uh, I've used it with neighbors. Uh, I've used it with family when we travel together that they had low tires or whatever and we had to get the tires pumped back up. Um, but I do have to plug that into an AC outlet or something that can do that, like a generator if you're out on the side of the road. So I really don't consider that part of my emergency kit. What I consider part of my emergency kit is a good quality, properly inflated spare tire because if something really goes bad and it's more than a nail or a screw, you're going to have to replace that tire and you can either sit on the side of the road or sit somewhere for hours and hours and hours on end waiting for somebody to come do it. Or if you got that spare tire, you can get it put on and head on down the road. A good quality flash shot is very, very important. We keep a couple inside the camper. We keep a couple inside the truck uh, because you never know what you're going to need when it gets dark. Uh, we have been in campgrounds uh, because something happened and we didn't get there till late and uh, being able to have a good quality flashlight, especially if you're in like a, uh, a Corps of Engineer or a state park or you're just in a family park or private park that just doesn't light them up uh, and you're trying to find your space, I will pull in and I will go walking before I go driving around. Uh, I think if you saw my video <laughs> of where the dumb things that we have done, I shared where I wasn't smart enough to do that and it's worth your time being able to go out with a good quality flashlight uh, and see where you're at and then as you get to your uh, campsite uh, you know pull up 
get out and just kind of scope it out in the dark and see what you've got available for you ever attempt to be able to back your campground in. And then having Joan, you know, give me guidance that she's got a very bright uh, flashlight and able to see things out there, then um, it's, just, it's just worth a lot of money. And it can be worth a whole lot of money if it's preventing you from damaging your camper. So you don't have to get all tactical EDC and go buy one of these $100 things that's out there. I'm not a fan of the ones that you have to plug in, you know, that you recharge. I'm just not a fan of those. I keep extra batteries if I'm going to need it. I'm a big fan of those that are 600 lumens or more. Um, that's my number. That's just what I'm a fan of. If you've got a 600 lumen or higher, uh, light visibility. That's how bright that light is. That's going to give you good uh, visibility. Now, um, you can go to Amazon, you can go to Walmart, uh, you can go to your big box stores. Usually if you go to an, a Lowe's, they've got a whole rack uh, of good lights and you, a lot of times you can test them out to see how bright they are. Um, and I'm going to show you two types that I like here. Now this one is an Ozark Trail. If you're familiar with Ozark Trail, this is a Walmart special. Um, it is bright as all get out. Um, it takes four uh, AAA batteries um, and it's super, super bright. It's cheap to be able to operate. And one of the things that I like about this, if I can show you in the camera, is I can expand it or contract it. And what this does is it will create a beam or it will create a flood, a spot or a flood. And I like that a lot, especially if you're at the camp site and I've got it pulled in like this and I'm trying to look around and just you know see what I'm going to be backing where I'm going to be backing into and those types of things to be able to flood that area with light this is incredibly incredibly helpful um, this is one this is an off-brand called uh, Utilitech um, and it's you know it's kind of tactical looking but this one is is I'm not going to shine this one into the camera light because this one is incredibly bright it, it is a spot only so this is like if I'm in the campground and I'm wanting to be able to look a long distance as I'm going out and trying to find our spot this one is super super bright and it's just like a laser beam that goes out there you know all these I think were under thirty dollars so you know they're all aluminum um, and they're waterproof because let's face it, you know, you're, there's going to be some time you're going to be out in the rain with one of these things, changing a spare tire, you know, something like that. Um, these are invaluable to be able to use. Don't buy just one. Buy several of these things. Keep you some extra AAA batteries if that's what yours requires to be able to keep these operational. When you need it, it's one of those things you're going to be incredibly happy you've got it in your emergency kit. I can't stress this enough about having this in your emergency kit. Get you a good quality weather radio. I cannot imagine having a RV and traveling, especially in the spring months or just those weird times in the winter uh, that you're somewhere and tornadoes or bad weather or something like that's going to come up. Even a bad severe thunderstorm that could have possible wind shears in it. Joan and I have had three different instances where tornadoes were very, very close by. Uh, one shook the dickens out of the camper. Uh, it was scary. Um, and uh, we've had two other instances to where uh, tornadoes were within a mile. That was down in Florida. And uh, we had a weather radio that went off in a timely fashion, gave us a warning. If you hear the warning, heed it. Just don't go, hey, the weather radio went off. and there's bad weather in the area. If it says that a tornado is coming by, know where your you know, safe place is in the campground uh, and head to that emergency shelter as quickly as possible uh, and get the heck out of Dodge um, so that you can uh, make sure that you're safe. To heck with the RV. Uh, your life is worth far, far more than uh, any material item. Get to that space and a weather radio is going to help you do it. This is a product by Midland. Um, we've been using this one for a long time. It works. It lasts. Um, it, it comes with a little wall wart that you can keep it plugged in. Um, but what happens if you lose power? I mean, let's face it. If you got bad weather in the area, you may be able to, you may be losing power. And then, then you don't have a weather radio. Well, this one also has a place in here for three 
AA batteries uh, that we keep in here. Uh, we change the batteries out once a year. Whether we use this once or twice, it doesn't matter. Um, we always want to make sure we have fresh batteries in it and it's going to work. They're super easy to set up. Uh, this one's got a long antenna. Uh, you, Depending on where you're at, we've been in rural areas um, to where it was hard to be able to pick this up and I had to move this around to different windows to get the proper signal. Uh, and the nice thing about setting these up uh, is they've got like a database that's built inside of those and when you turn it on you tell it what state you're in and what county you're in and then it will give you the alerts for that specific area and then these are multi multi frequency so it has all the weather bands in it and then you just move a little arrow here it's in the instructions you move it up and down until you get the uh, tower or the frequency in your specific area and they're they're repeating all the time giving you like a local forecast even if it's a bright sunny day until you can hear get the strongest signal and usually the strongest signal is the one that is for your specific area look uh, we've had we had two instances in Florida where we had tornadoes that were close by um, it went off um, one time very very early in the morning you know we jump up get Joan was in her pajamas you know and boom off we grabbed the umbrella grabbed the kitties and we ran as quickly as possible and the, the the emergency shelter was full of people and uh, fortunately we had nothing that came through our campground again it, it hit about a mile away and we didn't have to worry about it. another time we were up in nashville and uh, the thing went off and it, it got really 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 close before we could get out uh, but we did go get in that very you know concrete structure that they had in the campground in nashville um, and it the, we think the tornado came very very close to going over the top of the campground that we were at and then just went about a mile down the road and did a lot of damage um, directly in the path in which we were at and this radio went off now i, I will share this as well and it's going to be annoying but again we're talking about safety when you turn this on, or we're not going to leave it running during bright sunny days, but if we see on the news that we're going to have severe weather in the area, this thing gets cut on. Yep, you can use your phone. Yep, you can do that. Um, but I don't trust the phone as much because you're waiting on you know something.com app to be able to work for you, and you may or may not be able to get your alert in a timely fashion. I've had it where... The bad event has passed and then the alert came out on the phone that it was going to be bad in our area and if we would have been in a direct path it would we'd have been been in trouble these things are very very real time very real time again you may not have 10 minutes um, 15 minutes to be able to get out of the way of severe weather especially tornadoes but when they go off get moving and if you know that it's going to be happening during the night or during the early morning hours while you're sleeping, then I think that it's absolutely imperative that you have a weather radio going. I strongly stress it. I encourage it. Please get one. And it is going to disrupt your sleep during the evening. It just is. That's fine. That's fine. I'd rather you be tired and sleepy than possibly being in the path of a horrible weather storm uh, that could cause you bodily harm. And you can always take a nap when the weather gets pretty. So go out and get you. I'll put you a link for this one. This one, again, is by Midland. We've been using it for a long time. It's not very expensive. It's a very inexpensive device. I've even been in areas where uh, that the fire department gave these away, uh, this exact same model, and, um, and, and they wouldn't have given them away if it didn't work. So um, great unit. Get your weather radio. Don't travel without it. Well, let's talk about toolkits. I am going to have a basic, very basic set of tools to be able to handle very minor repairs that are going to occur. Look, I'm not going to rebuild an engine uh, somewhere. Um, you know, I'm not going to drop a transmission. Look, if I've got something that's very, very bad, that's, me that's a mechanical issue, it's going in the shop. Uh, let's face it, um, it's, it's just one of those costs of travel, and it wouldn't even matter if it was a cost of travel. If I was at home um, with my own personal vehicle, 
uh, that I'm not towing with and something bad happens to it to the point that it's going to have to have major repair, then I'm going to take it somewhere and get it repaired by a certified mechanic somewhere. I'm talking about having some basic tools to be able to get some basic tasks done in an emergency so that you can continue to enjoy your RV trip or your long-term RV travel. So a couple things, uh, like for instance, uh, we were in a campground once and on our F-350, the batteries died. Um, they were five years old. Um, they gave me no warning. Uh, they cranked up when we went to the campground and the next day, and they cranked up a second time uh, as we you know, were pulling out of the office and I backed in the, the fifth wheel. And the next morning I went to go somewhere and it was dead as a hammer. It wouldn't do anything. And I, you know, check the batteries. I'll show a few other things the way I could test the batteries and see if they were good. But I mean, I didn't even get a click. They just, when they died, they died. And these big diesel engines require a lot of battery. I got two big ones in there and it just wasn't going to crank up. It just wasn't going to happen. It was dead. It was gone. Um, and fortunately, I had some basic tools and it was easy for me to get two batteries. Uh, I called, I think it was O'Reilly's and said, uh, do you deliver around to the different shops? They go, yep. I gave them the model numbers. I said, as you drive by this campground, would you drop two off? I would be happy to. And I gave them a credit card, and then a couple hours later, I had batteries. But I couldn't have done it if I wouldn't have some basic tools. So go get you something like a basic socket set. This is what mine looks like. It's just a basic socket set. It's got both what they call SAE, which is like the American standard. Um, and then it's got some metrics as well. It's, you know, it's, it's basic, it's simple. Um, this one I think is a brand called Husky. Uh, you don't have to go out and spend a gazillion dollars for one of these things. You're not gonna be using that much, I hope. I hope you're not gonna be using it that much. So you can go on the lower end. You know, don't get it too cheap. You don't want it to break the first time you use it, but don't have to go out and spend, you know, a, an exorbitant amount of money to be able to get that. Now. Here's a little bag that I've got with some basic tools in. Now this bag has evolved uh, from day one when we traveled. Um, it's gotten just a tad bigger than when we first started. So I've got some basic tools in here to be able to handle, I won't call it emergencies, but maybe just some basic repairs. Uh, this is called an 11 in one. Uh, I would, <laughs> if, if I had one tool, uh, to use in my RV, it would be my 11 in one because you know it comes apart. It's got the what I call the um, the RV special uh, square head nut. It's got just, you know basic drivers. Uh, you can pull this out. You've got like nut wrenches that are inside of it. Those types of things. Basically, it's 11 tools. So I've got that. This is going to be to fix things like you know the the cabinet fell off the wall. I've actually got a, a, a video where the how to fix those cabinets when they get flimsy, wobbly, or just completely pull out of the hinge. That might be considered an emergency of some fashion, uh, but they're easy to repair and you can do it with this. You know, it's very simple and a little bit of epoxy glue. Uh, the other thing which I think is critical to be able to have in your kit when you travel, especially for emergencies, is a digital voltmeter. So we've had a couple instances where the power all of a sudden got weird and our uh, we've got a, um, a device uh, that we use on the pedestal to be able to give us surge protection and uh, it gives us protection if you have odd voltages, too high, too low, reverses, those types of things. Um, you know, and I was able, when we lost power because that unit turned off, I could go out there and check the pedestal. Very, very simple to be able to do that and realize, oh my gosh, um, something's wrong in the pedestal, I could call the campground. I know exactly what was wrong and we could get it repaired. I've had to do small electric repairs. Uh, it's easy to be able to check a fuse with this, those types of things. These are inexpensive. This is a no name uh, brand by, <laughs> that I bought off Amazon called an EOTech. Um, if you don't know how to use a digital voltmeter, yeah, you can go out to I Love RV Life, just type in digital voltmeter meter in the search and I've got a whole video on how to be able to use these. This is an indispensable, indispensable device to be able to have. You know, you want to have some of the basic things like, you know, everybody says you got to have duct tape and you got to have zip ties. I have some of those that are in here. I've got various screwdrivers. 
Um, I've got just little basic tools that I've needed over time, like um, I've got the little crimping lugs. If you ever have like a wiring problem and you got to put the lugs, lugs back on, the little crimping tools, and then a little plastic container of the various lugs, all Amazon type stuff that you can get, or Harbor Freight that you can go and get most of these things. They're basic. You're going to hardly ever need them, but when you need them, you're going to be glad you have them. Look, I could say, go out and buy this kit. This will handle every RV thing that you'll ever need. Uh, and it would cost a bunch of money. And you would probably not use 5% of the things that are in there. Um, you will buy them when you need them. Just have you a bag, know where that bag is. Another thing I would suggest you getting, I won't get it out. I've got an inexpensive Black & Decker style uh, drill. Um, there are going to be times that you might need a drill for something, if nothing more than to, you know, loosen nuts by the little kit that goes with it with all the little screwdriver adapters, a few of the nut drivers and those types of things that's on it. You'll find out that you'll be using that for one thing or another um, for repairs or basic emergency needs. Uh, that's handy, but just some type of a basic uh, Battery-powered electric drill is going to be another thing that's going to be very, very helpful in your emergency toolkit. Don't go buy everything you think you're going to need. You'll buy it when you need it, but just have some of the basics. A good socket set. You can buy every screwdriver you want, every nut driver that you want, or you can buy this 11-in-1. It's going to handle most of your needs. A good set of pliers. You know, those basic things to get you started, and then it's... You, evolve over time and see what types of things your RV is going to require you to have, then you can buy that item, add it to your kit, and if you never need it again, good for you. More than likely, you're going to need it again. Something that I've become a big fan of over the last several years of RV travel are these lithium-powered portable power stations. Uh, they've just got a huge amount of application both just for general travel and for emergency needs. What would happen if we talked about bad weather and you lost power for a period of time and you, you know, go to the campground office and they said, yeah, they'll have it back on in a day. Um, what would you do for those 24 hours if you may not have, say, a gasoline generator uh, and you need to be able to keep up the basic items within your RV to continue to enjoy your stay while you're there. Now, I'll share this with you. You're not going to be running an air conditioner off of these. That's not going to happen. Uh, if you get one of the bigger models, like you see a big one back here in the back I'll show you, then um, it's, you know, if, you, if you're fortunate enough to be able to run, say, a 13.5, BTU, a 13,500 BTU, you, you, you might be able to get an hour out of it. And then you don't have any power. You're completely out. So what you can run on some of these, the larger units that I'll show you here, you could run your household uh, refrigerator. If you've got a standard, you know, residential style refrigerator like Joan and I have, you can run that for a while. Um, if you've just got a small amount of battery, you know, for all your 12 volt systems that are here, and if you do have a residential refrigerator, more than likely, more than likely, you are um, not going to be able to have enough battery to run your uh, residential refrigerator for any long period of time. Now, I've got, again, in here, uh, I've got videos on this as well. I've got a 300 amp lithium battery, and I can run my RV without air conditioner and without the microwave. Uh, but I can run my refrigerator, all my lights, a TV. I can run all this stuff and you know sustain ourselves for over 24 hours, almost 36 hours off that battery. And if I've got good sun, I've got a little bit of solar. But but I can't run much else above and beyond that. And if you are one of those that just has maybe you know a small camper or even a large camper, and all you've got is a couple lead acid batteries and no solar and no gasoline generator, these portable generators are just an absolute dream and I've got three sizes that I'm going to show you here and I'll, I'll go through them quickly. Um, I've got full videos on each one of these that I'll put links to these uh, in the description today if you want some more details on them but I just want to show you what you can be able to use. Now this is one that I did recently called a Procron. Um, this one's a little over 600 amp hours um, and it's got a lot of nice features to it but again this is one of your smaller units 
uh, and it's not going to run a lot of things for a long period of time that are AC oriented like a residential refrigerator. Um, depending on the size of that residential refrigerator, you'll be lucky if you can get about eight hours out of it or so, again, depending on how hot and things like that go. But you can run a lot of other things. You can run a CPAP machine overnight if you're going to be out for 24 hours. Easily run a CPAP for eight hours or more. Uh, you can use it for some supplemental lighting. You can use it for your entertainment. You can plug a, a regular, like a, most of your TVs are between 30 and 60 watts, and you can watch TV at night uh, if you can get TV off an off-air channel or something like that. Um, keep your phones charged up. Keep your tablets charged up. And this, depending on what your budget is to be able to run, um, your, you know, all your different devices that you've got on, you know, like if all you've got is an electric coffee pot, you can make coffee in the morning if all, you know, but again, you know, you got your propane oven more than likely that you can do hot water, but you might not be able to make coffee from it, those types of things. And again, this would not run a 1200 watt um, uh, microwave. Uh, but some of these larger units will run a microwave with no problem whatsoever. But this is a great unit. It's not that expensive. Um, I also did another one here recently from G-Power where I showed a 500 watt hour and a 1000 watt hour. So these, you know, you can get small. I've gone through all the details of what you can do with those, uh, but this one works very well. Uh, this one is by, this one's heavy, so you're going to have to bear with me. Uh, this one is by Opez. Uh, this one has uh, 1800 watts this thing is a beast um, and I've got a video on it as well um, and this would be if you needed something like for a longer term power wow this it, you, without just you know burning through a lot of time in today's video you can go to that specific blog or you can go to that video where I give you a ton of details uh, but this one has got you know a, a lot of surge capability I, I even show where I hook it up to the side of the camper using an adapter. I'm able to run the microwave, um, refrigerator, and things like that for long periods of times to be able to use it. Now where this one really is very, very beneficial is uh, you can use, with all of these, you can use a portable um, solar panels. So I have here with this one, I've got four of these Opez 100 watt portable solar panels. Uh, they flip open. I'm not, I'm not going to have enough space to be able to show this, but they unfold. Um, in the video, you'll see that they'll unfold like so. Um, they've got their own stands built into them, their own cords built into them, um, and this one will handle up to 400 watts. So let's say you were in an environment to where you just don't have any power for whatever bad happened, bad storms or something like that, and you don't want to leave and you need uh, power for a period of time. Uh, this big unit here will handle up to 400 watts, and if you've got good sun um, and you've got four of these panels uh, that you want to use in a portable fashion, um, you can get by for a long, long time running a lot of different devices. Again, making the assumption you don't need air conditioning. Uh, you can run for a very, very long time. And even with these smaller units, like I was showing you earlier, um, you can put a solar panel on those and keep those working as well. So um, using something like this um, is, is really, really emergency preparedness if you're going to need power for a long time to run most electronic devices that are available. And if you don't have any power and you've got portable, portable or even if you've got fixed, fixed solar panels that you can plug into something like this, like if you're a van dweller or you just want to convert to something like this for your power needs, that works well as well. Again, go to that video and you can see it. And then I'll show you this thing. This is a Mars 2000 by Live Power. This is the largest one I have. See if I can pick this up sitting it down. This one, thing, this one is an absolute brute. Um, this one is a beast. Um, and this one has 2000 uh, watt capacity through the AC unit. Uh, it has a 4,000 watt surge. Again, we're not running air conditioners. Could you run maybe a little 5,000 BTU window style unit? Probably for a little while, but not long. Um, but this one you can plug, it has like Anderson plugs in it. You can also use a portable, uh, portable uh, solar panels with it as well. Um, it is an absolute monster, monster, monster. It's heavy. Um, I, again, go out to the video and you can see where I literally hooked it up to the camper. Look, we use this one all the time. 
when we travel, it is heavy. Uh, we use it all the time when we travel. Uh, if we need to pull over on the side of the road, I, or if we pull over at an, um, something like a, um, a rest stop or something like that, I can hook it up to the side of the camper. And we run microwaves and fans and, you know, just through the AC outlets, just like we were sitting in a campground and I'm not running our portable generator. We do have a portable generator, but I use it more for long-term boondocking or just where, you know, an emergency situation where we need to run that noisy thing. They're perfectly quiet. They work great. Look, you can get small. I'm thinking about someone who has to run a CPAP machine overnight um, and it's an emergency situation that they have no power. Uh, you can get all these three devices, even this one right here, even this one right here, or the one that I'm not showing, the G Power 1000 that I showed you recently, um, or run a CPAP machine 8, 10, 12 hours, you know, depending on what you need. You can charge them back up in your vehicle the following day if you have to, or if you've got a solar panel, you can do that as well. Um, and you can run a lot of other devices inside your RV as well. They're just, I think this is probably one of the better things that we can use. And I'll share this as well, that has no emergency need whatsoever. Um, we go to Florida a lot. We go to a couple times down to the beach and we take one of these units, one of the smaller ones down there, and we run radios or big boom boxes and blenders and we just stay down there from early morning till they run us off about seven o'clock at night and just have the best time with them. So our portable generators get a lot of use. Um, both in our travel and then we've got them just in case we need them in an emergency it's helpful as well well that's the end of my list that's 10 items I know it's probably a different style video for emergency prep in your RV and the types of tools or categories that you need than you typically see I'm just showing you what we've been using for 10 years and what works for Joan and I and what's gotten us out of more jams than anyone should ever have to face because we travel a lot and when you travel a lot you're going to have a lot more exposure and even for those rare times that you may have something happen and you don't travel a lot if you have some of the just even the lower cost basic items just have those in your emergency prep kit that you may need like the tools the flashlight the Eternabon, you know the lap sealant uh, some, you know, just basic tools, those types of things. You'll be so glad you had them because it won't wreck your trip or cause any further damage to your RV than you have to be exposed to. You'll be so glad you have it. I hope you found this one not too eclectic. I hope you found it helpful. If you like these, give us a thumbs up so that I'll know to be able to do these kind of like helpful type uh, videos in the future. I, I really follow your comments and your thumbs up on what you like and don't like. Um, we are probably going to be making some changes to the channel later this year because I have been looking at the analytics and we're probably going to be doing more of some things, I think, on the travel related um, that we haven't done been doing here for a while. And uh, we'll be showing a lot more of that as time goes on. And I hope that you find that helpful. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you for all your kind comments. They mean so much to us. If you've never subscribed to our channel, would you just do it? Hit that little bell. You'll see when our videos pop up. And thank you so much. I love doing these. I love giving you ways that we can help you. And you got it. I love RV life. Mm -hmm.